Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Broman Podcast 142, because there's been that many. Uh, today, I am joined by Rob Shepard Sage, or the RSS Feeds, as I have known him for a long time, Senior Program Manager at Twitch. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Good to talk to oh, you, man. Well, it's good to, yeah, it's good to, it's good to catch up. We spent some time talking about, talking about video games and everything beforehand, um so i we have been trying to get you on the podcast for a while um but i'm happy that we had so many delays because you you have a super unique experience right now uh going on in your life when it comes to your profession so we'll get to that in a second but what i like to do is start at the beginning so you know you you've where did you start to end up being a program manager for Twitch? Oh God, that is that is a very loaded question. Uh, so <laughs> my background, uh, believe it or not, is in no way, shape, or form related to tech. Uh, I have amazing. A, <laughs> I have a degree, in, a bachelor's of fine arts in trombone performance, classical trombone. Oh my God! And uh, music amazing. education. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, I spent some time after I graduated uh, doing substitute teaching and all of that. But at the same point in time, because uh, I, I was also, you know, a gigging musician, I uh, decided that uh, I wanted healthcare. And so, right? yeah, right. A lot of musicians really like having health care. I've heard a it's a great thing for super humans to have. important thing. Uh, <laughs> and so I got a part time gig working at Apple. Uh, I worked in Apple retail as a salesperson part time, did that for six years. And even within my time at Apple did sales. I led the visual merchandising team at my store. Uh, I became a mobile technician for about a year and then ended my time there uh, as a Mac technician. So I did kind of like the gamut of stuff at Apple. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, got to know Twitch as I was working there, got super into the community. And from getting to be part of the community, got to know some folks who worked here. And when a position opened up on Twitch's support team, I applied for that and was able to get my foot in the door and go from there. So it's been a, a weird journey that was not at all tech related into into where I am now. That it's just a couple <laughs> highlights, right? Like um, I have a friend that I went to high school with mm -hmm. and he's the only other person I've met in my life that professionally played the trombone like went to college for trombone fine arts he he for his like god i'm just hoping that you know what this is because it's like a trombone thing sure. so he did a performance that was like this avant-garde thing where he had to dress up like a clown and it was like a really weird piece of music i don't know this one but i'm now okay. super intrigued and we'll have yeah, to look okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> and amazing. he showed me i remember uh we haven't talked in a while but like he showed it to me like a long time ago and mm -hmm. he was like look at this look at this in the middle it just has like 30 rests and you're just supposed to scream why <laughs> like right in the middle of all of this these rest notes and i was like that's act it's in the annotation is how you have to do it's it there. i guess yeah there's yeah, some I, <laughs> really weird pieces that people have put together uh from my senior recital i did a piece by bernstein that's called elegy for mippy 2 and it's not because it's the second piece it's because his dog was named mippy 2 <laughs> wonderful uh, and it's an unaccompanied piece but the entire time you're supposed to be stomping your foot in time so you have to be doing it the entire time while you're playing which is it's not that hard but at the same time like you have to be keeping the right tempo you have to be doing all these weird things and it's a very jazzy piece at the same time it's awesome i loved it but it's just it's definitely weird but that's also not the weirdest piece that i've ever heard of i <laughs> So, so 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 is it just trombone that has like this kind of no weird, oh god no, no they, everybody's got everybody's some everybody's got something yeah uh, there oh so the, the weirdest piece that i know of for well not weirdest but uh one of the silliest pieces i know of is a, a piece called four minutes and 33 seconds and the entire thing is a person sits down at the piano and doesn't do anything they cool. just sit there and the the purpose of the piece of music is to be the audience and the sounds that they make being the performance 
So people like shifting in their chairs, like rustling papers. Yeah, it's it it's I yeah. like that. That's it's really heady shit. <laughs> I love that. That's so out there. That's like it's like the musician's equivalent of now entertain me. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, uh, <laughs> right. Like that's that's kick ass. So so you you were at Apple mm -hmm. as uh, you do. You started part time. You picked up all these skills, and then you got hired on a support team at Twitch. What what was what was that process like? I, I think it's just like any other process for me at least. I I came out actually when I was working at Apple. They at the time they were flying people out to do. Uh, training for when you became a Mac technician, or as they are commonly called, the geniuses at the store. Ah, ah, the, the most bar. pretentious title for a, a job that you'll ever hear, particularly in retail. Um, and we all know it. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but at the time, they would actually fly you out for three weeks to either like Atlanta or Cupertino and put you up and put you through training for three weeks to actually learn wow. how to be a technician and how to like do repairs, how to, you know, really learn their soft skills, things like that. And so when I was out here uh, in 2015, I got to uh, meet up with a couple of employees that were at Twitch. They gave me a tour of the office and I was like, all right, I like this place. I like these folks. At some point in time, I'm going to work here. I want to I want to make this happen and I want to just like this is happening. Yeah, it's just like and I, I have somewhere it's like on Instagram or something. I took a picture and I was like, nope, next time I'm back in San Francisco is going to be because I have a job here. And I was able to uh, actually I guess it was spring of the next year uh, positions uh, a position like was starting to open up. I applied a couple of times and didn't get any call i didn't get any response back uh, and then finally i was able to get a buddy to put in a referral for me and got my foot in the door and from there i was able to to get a job out here so that's incredible yeah it was it was what a fun story so like do you what was that what was that like getting on board with with twitch like at that point in its history right like it's still mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I remember, I remember, because we've known each other for a while. Yes, I remember, sir. like when you showed up in my chat with a wrench for the first time. <laughs> which, if you're if you're listening, and you don't know Twitch. Uh, a wrench icon in the in the chat means that you're staff. It means you work for Twitch. It's the only people who have it. And I remember being like, "Holy fuck!" You know, like so excited, um, so excited to to see that for you. So, like, what? What was it like working when Twitch was like still scrappy and like trying to figure everything out as and doing customer service, which I yeah. imagine was interesting. Yeah, like it, it's still interesting. It, you know, it's yeah. getting to help a community that I am super passionate about was one of the coolest things ever. I loved working at Apple because I was passionate about being able to do cool things with their products. I, I enjoyed mm. that. I got I built a lot of skills out of working at Apple and interfacing with the customers and being able to really know how to talk and be and to a certain degree how to perform for those folks. I was really able to learn and, and lean into that performance background. And coming to, to Twitch, it was a whole lot of the same. It was like, all right, it's the same skills that I know how to do. It's just now applying them in this new space. And I think that's been the thing that I've been really fortunate to be able to do over the past decade plus now of professional work is finding that through line of what skill do I have right here that I can continue to apply and evolve and, mm. and, and utilize to my advantage. And I think the biggest one from Apple was leaning into the skill of authentic empathy with the people that I'm helping. And that's something that is super hard to, to do, but if you can get it right and be authentic yeah. about it, it really lands well. Talk, talk to me about what that is. So like that's that is something that most people would consider like in the tech terms, a soft skill. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, as somebody whose primary mode of operation is as, as as a creative and entertainer, I wouldn't consider it that it's it's something that you like any form of communication. You can learn it and mm -hmm. you can lean into it and it can become it can become a tool that can do things that like raw numbers and things like that. It's just impossible to accomplish for them. So, so what, 
in a tech based world where everything is like performance mm -hmm. and numbers and binary bringing in authentic empathy like what did that what what does that look like on a day to day basis or what did that look like back at apple or yeah what yeah was, i'm so fascinated by that cuz it is such a unique thing to pull out it, when when you're looking at you know particularly <laughs> with apple um the way that they would go about it is they wanted the person that you were helping in whatever f way shape or form to feel like you gave a shit about them you gave a shit about yeah. what they needed and were able to do something to make it happen that could be you are trying to come in and buy an ipod for little susie or it could be you've locked yourself out of your phone and your child's photos from when they were just born are on that device oh my god like anywhere yeah. in between yeah like yeah. You, you're going to have that entire gamut and it's this idea of, all right, well, what is it that you as a person can connect with, with that other individual across the table from you and how can you actually make them believe that you care? Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. that's what it, anyone really wants to just be heard. People may not like listening to their own voice, but they like knowing that they're being listened to. And so if you can show somebody that you are engaged in that active listening and are yeah. able to actually engage in that conversation with them, they're going to care more about engaging with you. They're going to want to come back and they're going to want to actually continue to do business with you or, you know, continue to, to engage with you as an individual. And so taking that skill from Apple you can apply that in, in pretty much anywhere else. Like if you're able to go into a conversation and you're trying to influence somebody else on another team that you don't have authority over, like that's going to be a very common thing whenever you're working in a, co in a corporation, you're going yeah. and you're asking them to do something that they don't have to do, but you're going to them and saying, Hey, I think that this is something that we should look at. And this is a path that we should go down being able to, get them to come to the table is a super, super important skill. And and I'm personally not a huge fan of the idea of soft skills and hard skills. They're just skills. Yeah, I agree. And so that I think that's really what it comes down to is how do you build the skills to do what you need to do? That's, man, that is like one of the best uh, like thesis statements about why empathy is super important in corporate work. Mm -hmm. uh, because I and I, I just something about you talking about that reminds me of, you know, my dad's worked in a corporation his whole life. Right. Mm -hmm. And hearing the difference between when he was working for someone that would like listen to him and his team and when he was in charge. Right. Like when when he you know, when he was representing like the time of more than just himself. Right. Like it was great for him. Mm -hmm. um, and he had people he loved to work with. But anytime it was somebody who like didn't give a shit or just needed to get something done or only showed up like it's weird, right? Because mm -hmm. you have the experience of like, you know, both of these people are coming to your desk to ask you for something. And one of them, you don't mind. And the other one, you're like, ah, maybe go fuck yourself. Like <laughs> maybe, maybe yeah. don't ask me to do something that's like outside of my scope of work. And the thing that you're also doing is you're building capital. You're building personal mm. capital with individuals. Like if you're going to somebody and they and you have a reputation and a history of being a good collaborator, being a good team mm. player, and having those empathetic conversations and building that yeah. rapport, those times that you go to somebody and say, I need to put my foot down and we need to get this shit done, holds so much more weight. And you can actually really start to find those places that you feel like it doesn't happen often. I might have like one or two times that I'm going to do this in my professional career at this company. But yeah. when I put my foot down, you're, you're going to listen because yeah. we have that rapport. And so building up that and trading in that professional capital is, is a super challenging thing to do, but it is super important to be able to, to actually build up and, and work with. I am now so absolutely fascinated by everything that you just said <laughs> because because it is um to me it's it's like when when folks when I hear people talk about jobs right mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. There's always something where they're like, what's your salary? Mm -hmm. Who are you working for? They have good benefits. But it's it's uh, you don't hear a lot about, or at least for me externally, like the inner workings of stuff from like grassroots, like from someone who's doing the job. Mm -hmm. Right. It's Mm -hmm. always like, here's my like fucking business book on how I business my business. And you can business hard too. get ready to get ready to sync up on a quick call. Mm -hmm. Because as per my last email, this book's great. Like I, I fucking like I've read that stuff. Right. Yeah. But hearing like <laughs> thinking about how using normal human empathy inside of these things that are supposed to be these heartless machines and being and it being a successful, not just like tactic, but it's it's increasing the bottom line success of everyone involved. Absolutely. You know, and that I don't I know when I was growing up. I did not fucking hear that shit. Mm -hmm. And I'm, it's just really cool to know that it exists one (laughs) and, and two, to know that, that like it is, everyone always likes to be like, well, it's just like a heartless corporation, blah, 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 like all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's every, every company is made up of people and the people inside of any company or corporation are still being people and peopling together mm-hmm. and figuring out how to be a person and make a business happen. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I love the human aspect of it when it's so, yeah. Do you have any more comments about that? I yeah, so- actually to, to that end, I think we are, we're starting to see, particularly I would say within the last five years or so, we're starting to see that idea of leading with empathy becoming yeah. much more accepted and much more like researched and realizes like no this is the actual thing that a a really skilled leader does you are somebody who is actually empathetic and cares about your people those people are far more successful and lead far more successful businesses than that traditional like you know 1950s hard ass boss that you're you're used to <laughs> yeah. seeing on like you know Mad Men or whatever it's like yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. We're, you're seeing that shift happen and I think we're it's a, a really interesting evolution of the professional space and I'm so happy that it's happening because I think it's super important for everybody oh and it's so necessary mm-hmm. um you know like I like I said like my dad worked for corporations his whole life and you know like he does not have an awesome story. Like he wouldn't come on this podcast with a smile on his face. Right. Like yeah. you are. And, and, and I get that he's older, but like he's, he's lived through that really toxic business environment mm-hmm. where it's only about results and it's only about reporting in. And it's like militaristic hierarchy of, I have to do this yeah. and I have no voice. Um, it's, it's really, it makes me happy. Yeah. Well, it makes me feel like the world's getting better. E- look at even like, Going into the games world, you know, we're talking about, you know, uh, cyberpunk versus Mm -hmm. Hades. And you're looking at these development studios where people are unhappy and they put out a game that they're not necessarily the happiest with. I think it's cyberpunk's in a much better place than it was at launch. Yeah. But you look at Hades and you look at Supergiant and you're like, they haven't released a game that doesn't hit. It's true. All of their games hit hard like they don't have yes. a miss in their in their catalog i love bastion i love transistor dude right so, like transistor has one of the best sound like all their soundtracks are just so good oh right I, i'm such yeah. a fan but i i think that if you look at their corporate culture as a company super giant is very much like a no we we don't have people answer things outside of business hours weekend mm. stuff doesn't happen we don't have that necessarily that, that same idea of crunch, like which, which has been a huge thing in the industry as yes. of late is talking about tech crunch and, and getting to that master release. And I think the more we celebrate and recognize how good the companies like Supergiant are able to do their mm. stuff, the better that industry is going to actually become over time. And I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to start to see that change more and more. Sorry, I was just writing that down because it's really, it's a really good point. <laughs> Recogni- recognizing good change. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think, I th- God, your example is just so fucking good. <laughs> right. Like, so, and you can, you can see in your example, you can see that 
there's a stronger correlation of consistent creative output mm -hmm. among the people that are empathetically supported. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I talk about games as art all the time. Yeah. But, you know, games are an interdisciplinary art practice. You know, just like if you were to build a highly complex sculpture that moved, right? You would need engineering. You would need materials professionals. You would need your vision. You'd need, like, the creative artist driving it. Um, you'd need people that could set it up like, you know, there's all of these parts and like people forget that games are like that on this grand scale. Like you take everything mm -hmm. I just mentioned and then you add coding, you add you add, you know, lighting, you add sound, uh, you let you add interactivity, which thinking about <laughs> it like this, like that, the whole process. And then you add interactivity. Yeah. It feels fucking mind blowing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really interesting to me that you see that. Both both games had super incredible creative visions, right? Yeah. Um, and and both of them, you know, they took their time getting their product out the door and then improving their product after it was out the door. Mm -hmm. And and yet, you know, one game is a, a massive critical success. And then the other game is kind of unfortunately like the Internet's favorite uh uh, punching bag. Yeah, I was about to say it's the meme, like the yellow, yeah, the, the, the yellow apology, like yeah, right, image yeah. is like that's the meme. Everybody knows it, and and that's not to say that the people that aren't that worked on Cyberpunk aren't good people, and they yeah. didn't work hard, and they don't that's, have passion yeah, exactly. for their project, and they should des they deserve all the credit in the world for putting out this insane thing. Yeah, it's a technological marvel. Any game that gets yeah. shipped is a technological marvel. Absolutely marvel. I probably agree. should have prefaced that conversation, <laughs> but that's how I feel. Yeah. If the if the if the sculpture metaphor didn't get that there, <laughs> but yeah, I mean like it but coming down to the 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 crunch culture versus mm -hmm. letting your letting your team this product has to breathe, we need to let our team breathe and we need to polish it until it's done versus this is the deadline, let's smash it out mm -hmm. is like it's really it is just interesting. Yeah, it is really like you said. It's it's interesting to compare those, and, and it, mm -hmm. it is all that empathy side. Like mm -hmm. the the yeah. crunch, crunch culture comes out of a lack of empathy, in my okay. opinion. Because yes, now please connect those dots. I'm into it. Because <laughs> in my mind, what they are doing is they're letting the numbers drive their decisions. They're letting this idea of we need to get this out the door by holiday. We need to you know get this. Mm. We need to finally like cut the dollars that we're spending on the development side and start recouping some of our losses that we have in there. Mm. And they're pushing themselves so hard and so hard and so hard. And if they were able to have that empathy for their own team and let that empathy be the driver of how they're going through their development cycle, you get, I think, to a, and again, I could be totally wrong. I'm just talking out of my butt here and not actually knowing the inner workings of these companies, but it seems like that's how Supergiant does it, is this idea right. of we are an empathetic company to our employees in terms of scale, way different. Yeah. You know, Supergiant's much smaller, much and, smaller. And, and so you're you're not getting to that same, that same scale, but I think that that's what to their credit is that they've said, we don't need to get this big. We can stay at our mm. small size. And I think I've read somewhere, I could be totally wrong. So if I'm spreading some misinformation, I apologize. I think that they have like super low turnover overall mm. for their company as well, because people just like working there and people yeah. like developing with them. So, I mean, they, they seem delightful yeah. after all of, after <laughs> all of this stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm really curious, like how if you could like make a magical scenario happen, like how, this idea of of recognizing good change in the industry, mm. like what like industries do their own award shows all the time. Like, is it like a, here's the tech good awards for like or, like it feels difficult, right? Because yeah, I've yeah, been yeah. thinking about it since you mentioned it and everything felt too self congratulatory. So I'm really curious, is it is recognizing good change? I guess the ultimate question comes down to is it going is good change going to be something that's going to end up as a consumer recognized thing mm -hmm. where like, oh, wow, all the studios that are leading this way are only producing really positive product products and, and selling. Or is it going to be something where it's like. Look at these guys are great. Everyone should be like them. Uh, realistically, I think that it's more it, what is going to happen is more the latter. 
Um, right. Just because okay. I think it is, it is really hard when companies are at a certain size to, unless you're getting everybody to speak with their wallet, they're right. just by the law of big numbers, they're going to recoup their investments just because they're going to be enough people that still invest in it. Yeah. Um, I, I think when it comes to anything regarding positive reinforcement, uh, it's the same thing as giving feedback to a coworker. Whenever you are a manager, whenever you're leading a group of people, the kind of uh, the rule that you think of or the, the guidance that you think of, at least from my experience, is you need to be praising three times as often as you're giving constructive criticism because mm -hmm. people don't remember praise. People don't focus on those times that they get told, you're doing really well. This was a really great thing that you're doing. This led to this really good result. This was a really good interaction. People don't focus on that. They focus in on that time. It's like, hey, you know that presentation that you gave? You left out a comma. You might want to make sure that you're you're reading through these things. People, I quit. <laughs> I quit. Anybody tell me I left out a comma, I'd be like, yeah. That is not the value I'm bringing to the table. <laughs> Could, did you understand what I wrote? Yeah. And okay. It, cool. We're good. And that might be a, that might be a bit myopic, but at the same no, time, I mean, it's like, like I, yeah, it's, I get it's it. that, that criticism portion. It's like you focus in on it, and you're your own worst critic. I know that you, True. you as a performer, are I'm sure very aware of this. Like you yeah. will look back at a stream that you did three weeks ago, and like, why the hell did I do that? Why was this wow. like this? These this sucked. This sucked. This was. I did okay there, but this was god awful. Like, I hated this. Yeah, exactly. And and I'm the same way. Like I I spent years of my life sitting in a practice room by myself, practicing my instrument and critiquing myself and telling myself that wasn't perfect. Go back and do yeah. it again. Try it again. Try it again. Be more accurate. Be more yeah. on tempo. And everybody is their own worst critic and being able to recognize that and say, all right, I'm going to pull myself back from those criticisms and allow myself to celebrate my own wins and yeah. have that will help out with that mental state. But I think that to go back to the original point, I think that's how we have to approach the game industry and how we're going to approach better change overall for companies as a whole. Mm. It's really easy to show outrage. It's really easy to say cyberpunk sucked. Right. It's a lot harder to say, I really liked what this company did, this company did, this company did, and this company. Because we trade in a, a environment right now of outrage. That's how a lot yeah. of this actually, you know, you, you grow by those numbers and you want to see numbers go up and to the right. And so it's really hard to, to, separate that out and and allow yourself to have those celebrations so i personally like seeing more people doing that celebration i think we're starting to see that more and, and not like the the idea of just oh we're going to say praise for praise sake like actual meaningful feedback that's good and positive give specifics mm -hmm. give actionable things that people can do and actually continue to do that's where it really comes into into play that is i love that so so let's transition a little bit. Okay. That was a great conversation. Like super happy. <laughs> I want to keep us moving. Absolutely. Um, let's do it. So what, what was it like, like changing verticals inside of your company mm -hmm. going from customer service to marketing? Cause yeah. that's, it feels different. It feels pretty different. So depending on the company that you're going to be in, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying I've only really done this in the one. So I'm speaking a lot from just anecdotal conversations that yeah, I've had your with experience. others. Yeah, Yeah. Um, having folks in, uh, having customer support uh, be a part of the marketing org in a company is not the most uncommon thing. You know, you'll, you'll see that happen. Um, so that's, that's what allowed me at least to uh, more easily make that transition was we were already part of that organization. It was all one group. And so I was able to, I had already started some uh, collaboration and working and, and it was a natural evolution for me. Mm -hmm. That said, uh, terrifying. Um, it was terrifying <laughs> making this change. Cause you know, I, I started at Apple in 
God, I started working at Apple in, when was that? That would have been 2011 is when I started there. Spent six years at Apple Retail and then did four years in the customer support and customer experience team. And so that's a decade worth of, of time doing customer service and customer support as my yeah. main focus. And so I was really comfortable in that space. I know how to think like a user that's going to need help. I know mm -hmm. how to have that empathy and I know how to, to have those conversations. And that is absolutely my comfort zone. I was very much like a, I know how this world works. I'm, I'm pretty good at what I do. I know how to handle these types of scenarios and how to have these conversations. And then moving into the marketing world, I, I don't know marketing. I don't know like marketing campaigns versus everything else. Like it's a totally different world. There's so many different things that- you know, It's a monster. It, there's terminology <laughs> that I just wasn't familiar with. There was just a whole lot there that I, I was going to have to learn. And that's a super daunting thing for anyone, but it's also super exciting. And it was something that I was really looking forward to taking on as a challenge and, and really pushing myself. And it all came back to advice that I, I tried to give to people that I was managing, which is whenever you're looking at a new job or you're looking for somewhere new to go, if you're not exactly happy with what you're doing or you're not sure where to go, take everything that you've done and try to distill it down to the thing that you liked the most. What was that thing that you were able to find as a waitress and then as a support person and then working you know, at an esports gig? What was the thing about each of those seemingly separate and not at all connected responsibilities that you liked? Mm. If it was, I liked being able to help people get to, to, to do the things that they needed to focus on and I'll like remove those responsibilities for them so that they could do it. Or if it was, I liked being able to take a look at the problems that were happening for the group and find a solution for them. You're probably going to be able to find a thing or a couple of things that you really enjoyed for all of those that is a through line for all of those items. Mm. And if you can figure out what that item is and then start to pull that out and push yourself in that direction of finding how to do that more and be able to focus on that more, you're going to be happier. To be super honest, I didn't enjoy people management that much. I was good at it, but I, it wasn't really where I found a ton of joy. And so mm. the thing that brought me a lot of joy in what I was working on is I like problems. I like solving a process thing and seeing an inefficiency and saying, how can I make this better? How can yeah. I let people who are doing these menial things stop doing them and instead get to focus on the cool, hard stuff? So I love being able to find those inefficiencies and fix them and make them better and make them easier. And that's really what I've been able to focus on in just different contexts at this point in yeah. time. So that's, that's, for me at least, what I focused myself in on when I made the transition and I was making this change is how do I start to actually do that in this new position? And that's why I was comfortable actually going over to that new role was I was able to, I was going to be doing that just in a, a new space. The challenge just becomes learning that new space. So you become comfortable and are able to then put those efficiencies in place as needed. That is, man, that was a great answer. That was very, <laughs> it's a very holistic answer. Um, so you talked you talked about like you love to refine inefficiencies and in systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I too also as well enjoy that. Um, so I'm I'm curious what so that style of problem solving mm -hmm. um, and that that kind of joy. What how does that apply in marketing? Like what are the things that you're you like to fix? Yeah, it's it's a lot of letting people be creative and not focus on the bureaucratic bullshit. Mm. Because when you're doing marketing stuff, 
yes, you're, you're going out there and you're trying to put your brand out in front of somebody or you're trying to make more people pay attention to you or you're trying to, you know, say, hey, you should really tune into this specific thing that's going to be happening. It's going to be super cool and super great. But the way that you do that is by really creative thinking and processing and, and creation. And mm. behind the scenes, the stuff that people don't see is the bureaucratic, like, okay, well, I need to make sure that, you know, Susie and Tony and Jacob are, are all working on the same thing. And they're all, they all know what we're working on behind the scenes. Yeah. And we've got all this, this other stuff. It's like, all right, cool. How do we take that bureau bureaucracy portion reduce it as much as possible to make it as easy and lightweight as it can be. So that mm -hmm. way you're not spending time filling out forms and instead you're spending time making a cool video or making a cool asset or coming up with a really cool plan to put something in a, like up on a billboard or something like that. Yeah. Like, I, how do you come up I, with those plans? I love that. That's, I mean, it, it's funny because linear thinking you just you just made me think about this like linear thinking is like super necessary in creative work like mm -hmm. everybody everybody likes to act this is fun because this is just showing up everywhere in this in this conversation people like to act like well this is a creative so it's like it's like you know this is the right side of the brain or whatever and like you're in and let me tell you you can increase the creative output of your team by giving them a really straight line to follow when they need to communicate and do the bureaucratic shit because that shit has to get done, right? Like, you cannot just be like, all right, everybody, like, we're, we're on Project X. Hope everyone's got the same assets. Let's do this. Like, everyone needs to, you have to communicate, and but that communication can be so onerous. Like, mm -hmm. we learned that um at rare drop during the pandemic and kevin will say this until he's blue in the face like he will we 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 will never hire remote for creative work um like we love like working remotely with like people who are freelancing and things like that but mm -hmm. if you're going to be a full-time employee and and have created out creative output at the company it's just fucking impossible to try and take like a breakout session where everybody had a good idea and then like take the idea and compress it into an email and push it out because so much is like if you're trying to come up with a skit so much is happening in that meeting mm -hmm. so when when you leave if everyone is there everyone has a rough idea of how it's going to go a rough idea of how it's going to get shot how it's going to get scripted who's going to be involved right and you can go from that commonality to produce your specialized parts trying to build that commonality without everyone in the room is soul crushing because the communicate like because the slightest misinter misinterpretation um that is like completely understandable and totally what you wrote right like mm -hmm. that's what i wrote 100 percent, not wrong right that kind of miscommunication can lead to steering you off course just enough that you end up with a fire a train wreck of an activation and so like if you are if you're listening to this and you're a linear, linear thinking person and you are maybe surrounded by creative folks, you might be surprised how much you could help them because we need help. Hi, I'm <laughs> I fully I, I also realize that like I embody that I have the chaotic creative energy around me all the time. And that's something that I've been we've been like you have to figure out how to refine that and put it into an organization. Right. You can't just be like, hey, guys, what's up? Here's my. There's, you know, a, there's a place like, for it all. <laughs> yeah, and, and you, but but like when once we started bringing in more organizational tools and everything like that, um, it became easier for me to do my job. And it's really it's really fun to be on a team where you can sit across the table from someone and say, I have no idea how you're doing what you're doing and I'd never be able to do it. But thank you because it's made my job so much easier. And when you have the when that feeling is mutual, mm -hmm. you know, when the person's like, well, I'm not creative like that. So I don't know how that works. Like it, it's great. Guess because what, I guess what you just yeah. described. What? Empathy. Empathy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but that, you know, it builds rapport, the capital yeah. that you were talking about. Right. I guess this is how I've experienced it recently in my professional life then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you, you end up in a place where everybody's output is increased just because you have an understanding of how you can best assist each other by letting everyone do their job. 
that's something I tell people a lot when we're talking with charities. It's like, you're going to work with streamers. What you need to do is you need to show up with an outline of asks that is super loose, right? I'm giving away the secret sauce. Oh, no, I talk about it on stream all the time. If only you'd just watch the stream, then you wouldn't have to talk to me. Charities, <laughs> it's fine. Um, but, but, like, it, you, if you just let them go into their creative process with mm -hmm. instructions, like, we're the charity. We want these things. We'd like to highlight this. Here are some assets. You're going to get blown the fuck away by the quality of, of work you'll get out of the people who are fundraising for you because all you have to tell people is where to start sometimes. Yeah, you're engaging with those people for a reason. You're, you're going yeah. to them because they have built up this expertise and they've built up this skill set that you can trust them if you're giving them that outline to do mm -hmm. what they need to do. So it, it, it goes back to just it's that trust and allowing people to do the good work that they can do how how has having a fine arts major in trombone helped you be a better senior program manager <laughs> uh communication actually really yes uh so so, so here, <laughs> this here, is awesome so, i'm so excited so about this entire answer um I, I i have written about this a little bit but here's the uh the long and the short of it when i was in school i was in a uh, a master class with one of the foremost bass trombone players in the world, uh, a person by the name of Murray Crew, who sadly has passed away. Um, absolutely incredible, incredible person. Um, and when I was in the lesson with him, he, I played my piece. I, was, I thought that I did great, you know, really was putting my heart and soul into everything, finished up. And he's like, you know, this could have been more expressive. You know, I, I heard some movement. I heard that there was some, you know, that you were going in the right direction, but you could do it more. You need to be over emphasizing what it is from your side because we're not getting what you get. Um, I don't, so I don't know. Do you, have you ever played an instrument? I did. I played uh, bass for like four or five years. Okay. So yeah. When you're playing an instrument and when you're learning how to play play music, for those of you out, here, out there who are familiar with this, you have three pieces of information, really, that are informing what you are hearing or what you are interpreting as the music. There's what's written on the page. There's what's happening in your brain, your thoughts. And then there's the sound that you're producing with your instrument. So that's three pieces of information that are going out into the world from your perspective. From the audience, though, they can't see what's on the page. They can't see what's happening in your brain. So they only have that third piece of information. And so you have to, in that one piece of information, convey the other two parts that you have that they don't. And whenever you're having a conversation with somebody, whenever you're talking about something, and it's even harder when you're in a space or in a, a situation like we are right now where so much of what we do is through written communication. You have to communicate those two pieces of information in whatever it is that you're giving to the other person. That's tone of voice. That's word choice. That's even punctuation to some people. Uh, you know, you'll get the text message that has a period at the end versus one that doesn't. And that one with the period sounds way more serious for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so communication and understanding how to effectively communicate is really what has allowed me to do well in Apple. It allowed me to do well as a support person. And it's allowing me to do well as, this, as a program manager who has to communicate all the time. That's what I do is I communicate and I build the process but then I have to tell people about it. I have to get yeah. feedback. I'm not going to be building this thing in a vacuum. I'm building it so that, you know, everybody has an easier time, but I need their input for that. I can't yeah. just build in a vacuum or else I build something that doesn't fit their needs. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, I've just wasted three months of time. So having that understanding and being able to communicate is I think the best skill that I've learned from my time as a musician. That's was fucking awesome. Uh, that was so good. Uh, there was, there was. I would love to know. So, like, we've been talking about all this positive stuff. Yeah, yeah. that was so good. Um, I would love to know. Uh, what are some ways that you deal with frustration mm. 
inside of your environment, right? So we've talked a lot about the autonomy that you have when you're, you know, working in teams, but there's still restrictions. And sometimes, like you mentioned, like, what if you're working on a project for a few months and it just gets canned because like, oh, it's going bye bye. Like, what, do you have any secret sauce to help people deal with 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 the, those kind of frustrations that yeah. are just going to happen? Right. right. Projects get axed. Things don't follow through. It fucking happens. Absolutely. You man, that it, that is still one of the hardest things, particularly when you are somebody who. And a lot of people are, I think a lot more people in than I think the public gives them credit for a lot of people are so passionate about the communities they're helping, the, the people that they're working with, the, you know, even when I was working at Apple, like I was passionate about helping people because the products that we would sell would legitimately change lives for some folks. Yeah. But there are times where you're going to be asked to do stuff that doesn't, doesn't work and it doesn't, you know, jive with what you want to do. And at a certain point in time, I had to come to terms with this idea of I can vocalize my dissent. I can be unhappy with what the choices are being made. But unless you're the person at the very, very top, at a certain point, somebody's going to make the call and you just have to roll with it. Mm. And hopefully those times where you just have to roll with it are you know, vastly outnumbered versus the times where you're able to actually like have that collaborative conversation. Mm -hmm. But there are times where you just have to roll with it and it sucks and it is not fun and yeah. you get angry and you get tired and you get burnt out and you have to give yourself that ability to say, okay, yeah, that fucking sucked. That was not great. That, you know, no. I, I, I did not have fun with that one. I, I distinctly remember <laughs> there was a point in time when I was at Apple <laughs> where uh, we discovered, we were pretty sure that there was uh, somebody or a group of people were basically hiring people off the street to come in and sign up for phone service and using their IDs, totally legit right. IDs, legit information. And then they were just taking those phones from those individuals and flipping them for profit. Wow. And we knew it. We knew it was happening. And it felt so bad selling those phones to folks because you could see yeah. it happening and you could see it. And I remember at one point in time having to tell my manager I needed time off the floor because I was just so sad about what I was right. doing. And we had the conversations with the leadership team. We had you know, they bubbled it up to the corporate and eventually things did change. You know, things happened where we were able to actually, you know, curb that a whole lot more. And it, it kind of fell off from what I could tell. But there was definitely like a period in time where it sucked. And yeah. we just at a certain point, we did everything we could. We surfaced it to the right people. And they're like, hey, this is just something we got to go with for now. You got to have faith that something is going to happen but things don't happen necessarily as fast as you want them to. And so I, I definitely had to had that moment of just like, Oh, this is horrible. This is yeah. shit. And, and you're just like, all right, step back onto the floor, start doing the thing again and, and hope that those times are outweighed and outnumbered by the good times and the good interactions and the good conversations that you have. And yeah. that, that's, what I, I've had to fall back on time and time again. And it's a, a really hard thing to do, but you know, being able to talk to people about it is super nice. Like friends, friends, Co professionals, therapy, professionals, therapy, yeah. like I'm so glad that, you know, people going to therapy is becoming less and less stigmatized because holy shit, is that great? Like yeah, going, therapy's you know, awesome. Being able to go, go to and just therapy. Like, I can talk to somebody about it. It's I had, great. <laughs> I had therapy last night. You know, it was awesome. It's um, so draining. Like there are times where you'll just like finish, you're like, oh, my brain's a noodle. I'm just like emotionally spent. Like yeah. it's so good. It's like any muscle. Like the more you exercise it, the more that yeah. you like exert it to the point where you're just like, I can't do it anymore. It becomes mm -hmm. stronger and it starts to yes. build up again. And and so. 
th those are the uh, uh, it's yeah. kind of like been the journey of conversation there but yeah that's that's really how it's kind of gone for me at least no i mean i think you i think you highlighted the the reality that uh there's always going to be bad times like and this is this is the thing and hey what's up entrepreneurial self-help gurus i'm about to blow up your course you're selling to everyone um there is no such thing as being employed or making money or living on this fucking planet at all that you're never going to have a uh, an, a day where something wrong doesn't happen, mm -hmm. right? There's always going to be, I mean, we're so connected. If you want to find something that's wrong with the world right now, you can find it. If you want to find something that's wrong inside of whatever your organization is, you probably can find it too. Mm -hmm. um, and you're always going to have to deal with with bad days. And the thing that has helped me because I got super burned out um, and I felt like every day was a bad day. Um, and I had, I had believed that for so long that I had like accepted it as a reality. Like it's either every day is either a complete and total win or an absolute abject failure and travesty. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was no in between, which is super not healthy by the way. And I'm sorry if you just felt personally attacked on the podcast, but it's not healthy. It's not good to think that way. Um, you need to give yourself some space. So for, for me deciding um, I started a gratitude journal. That was something yeah. that really changed my 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 perspective when I was super burned out. Was I was wrote down five things I was happy with every day, and let me tell you, I have experienced physical pain in my life. There were some days because man, I just was so entrenched that burnout. It was the burnout was strong, and my levels of frustration were super high, um, and I felt like shit was just not working. And sometimes I was like gritting my teeth and I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. And I'm like, I guess I like this. This is fucking OK, maybe like mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be goddamn pretty, but you need to decide. This was my big my big thing is um, even a bad day can have good moments. You deserve to be happy a little bit every day, even on your worst day uh, and accepting accepting that um and uh you know watching my mom like live that she's had a lot of loss over the past couple of years with covid and family members and stuff um but anytime we talk even if she's calling to give me awful news like this person died or that person died um uh, unexpectedly she'll always talk about whatever good thing happened that day too um and it it changes a lot more than you think. It feels really tiny and small. Yeah. But it's it's massive. My family, when I was still living at home, uh, it was both my parents and my younger brother. And what we would do, family dinner every night, we'd sit down, have food on the table before anyone started eating. Everybody went around the table and said at least one good thing that happened to them that day. Mm. What a good practice. And, it, you know, it was just it was a simple thing. And it could just be like, I, I had a good run or I was able to solve this stupid math problem or whatever it was. There's just that one good thing or like I came home and the dog was really happy to see me. That yeah. was a really good thing. You know, right? having those moments and being able to recognize and celebrate those moments is like, all right, there is that thing that I can center on. It, it felt mm. really cheesy to me at the time. And like you're a kid and you're just like, I just want to fucking eat the food. Let me yeah, have I'm my food. Starving, <laughs> but it's good. Like it, it's that that practice of like, <coughs> this is what we can do as a family to celebrate and be happy together. So that was something that we did that was nice. That's awesome. Yeah. That what a good what a good practice to instill like that. I love I love looking. Um, it's it's funny how you know, for me like I was like taught always look on the bright side and then when i started making money everyone's like fuck that have you seen money you can look at this all day bright or dark this this the uh, you know this money is this money's money sun's out or the sun's down mm -hmm. you know uh and and i think that a lot of times we uh and i'm, I'm speaking from the broadcaster entrepreneurial perspective but we get caught up in um attaching our value to our output and mm -hmm. um, I think as if you're if you're a solo worker, if you're if you're streaming, if you're a content creator, 
um, if you're like an entrepreneur, you're running your own business, like your output is directly measured in dollars more often than not. And it can be really, really difficult to step away and tell yourself that you have value outside of your output. But here, hearing you talk about projects made me realize like if you're working inside, you know, if you're working for someone else, you have that same experience. You have that experience of of loss or, you know, your output changes, right? Like for me, sub numbers drop really bad for a month because I had a really great month and month before whatever. All these economic indicators that would tell you like your output has decreased, but it hasn't. Yeah. I've been doing I did the same job both months. It's just different. And I think that uh, I was reminded of that when you were talking about working through this stuff when you have a failed project, because it doesn't mean or it doesn't mean like, oh, suddenly your output was bad or the, the last two months of work that you did were pointless mm -hmm. because you can still bring intrinsic personal value to the table about how it helped you grow or name a goddamn thing. Yeah, there there is at least one skill that you built during working on whatever it was that you were working on that you're going to bring into the next thing that's going to make your life better. Promote this guy. <laughs> um, give him all of the promotion. Uh, yeah, I love that. Um, we're coming up on the end here. I feel like this has been, I'm going to like send this to people in my life that like <laughs> didn't think my job's weird. And I'm going to be like, I tell you what, yeah, listen to this guy. My this life's is, this, weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone's like, 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 like yeah, well, you, that, that only applies to you because you work, you got a weird job. It's like, ah, no, nah. like you, I think uh, this is, this has been incredibly refreshing and, and hopeful for me to hear about how corporate culture and how things are changing um and how how much empathy has been such a key skill for you throughout yeah. your entire experience it's been truly fascinating so um now it's your turn if you have anything that you have that you want to promote that you want to talk about you want to tell people to do you could you could just tell them your favorite kind of pizza like whatever you want uh well, floor is yours. i'll start with i am team pineapple on pizza so you know come at me with what you will that's um, fair. <laughs> you're allowed to hate me for it, but I, I'll still eat it. It's delicious more for me. Um, no, I, I, I'm a big fan of the, the idea of just being excellent to each other. I think that's a big one and help people, you know, just be good mm. and help people. However that turns out, if that's, you know, donating to your favorite charity, if that's going and volunteering, if that's just, you know, telling somebody that, you know, hey, I really appreciate the work that you're doing or your friendship or whatever. Just be good to people and help people. That's really where I, I, I want to, I, I'd say that I end it. Fuck yeah. <laughs> I agree. Be good. Help people. Uh, it, is a, it is a wonderful mindset to carry with you regardless of what your jobs are. Yeah. Regardless of what you do every day. I think walking around with that focus is always beneficial for yeah. sure. So, yeah, I can't give you any better advice than that. So if you are listening to the podcast uh, and you are interested in more from. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to hiccup. It's all right. OK, that was weird. Do your thing. Uh, if you're listening, if you, <laughs> there you go. Live edit. Uh, if <laughs> if you're interested in hearing more uh, from Rob, it's at the RSS feeds on Twitter. I'm Professor Broman. You can put that in a search box and find me anywhere you want. Um, but more important than that, I would love for you to share this podcast with anybody that it made you think about, uh, today. I, like I said, I have a, a few people in, uh, that were corporate jobs that I'm going to send this to and be like, see, uh, so, you I know, whoever you. that I told you, uh, I told you. So if you want to, uh, if you want to prove somebody wrong, this is a great episode to prove <laughs> someone wrong with. Um, or if you want to start an argument, this is a great argument starter. It's really good. Uh, especially the pineapple bit. Especially the pineapple bit. Yeah, 100%. 100%. What does he mean? I don't know. We're just ending the podcast, and I didn't stream today, so it's weird. Uh, thank you so much for watching today, everybody. I hope you had a good time. If you're listening out there, leave a review and all that good stuff. I'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye.